thing about the Lord is in Him everything is significant. And All right, Father, we bless you. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be together in you. Father, we yield to you to bring forth truth, knowledge, revelation, understanding, establish us, Father, on the rock, the one that makes us strong in you and in the power of your might. Father, help us to obey the Holy Ghost. Help us to yield and allow him to transform us yeah. from who we have been into who we should be. Yeah. Father, I thank you. You said if we ask, we will receive. So we yield to you, Father, to have your way with us tonight and every night. Teach us and help us to learn and put into practice those things that you establish us in. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen. All right. Amen. All right, we press through. I think we're in Revelation chapter 10. And uh, we've been going through it. Um, last night was a blessing to me. I don't know about the rest of you, but it was really good to, to get back in there. And we made it through 7, 8, and 9, I think, uh, last night. Uh, hopefully we can get through 10 and 11 tonight, by the grace of God. Amen? But we've, we're, we're trying to establish the truth of God's plan, His purpose. It has to do with the kingdom of God. Uh, I think we've already established that his kingdom has to be here or he lied. Amen. And he doesn't lie. Amen. So his kingdom's here. So we we understand that, but now we've got to find how we fit into this kingdom. How does the kingdom fit into us? Because with the kingdom of God here, we understand that through Daniel chapter 7, that the kingdom of God was given to us to possess, not to just be a part of. And uh, so it's vitally important. You figure when God gives you something, he has a righteous expectation that you're going to do something with it. You're not just going to store it up. You're not just going to hold it. You're not going to sit on it and, and bide your time, but that you're going to put it out there and allow God to utilize it uh, to glorify himself, to further the kingdom, to further your life in every way. I mean, he's looking at, at blowing this thing up so that he can reward those who sit in darkness and also those who are being used as the light. Amen? Amen. So he's trying to get us kingdom minded. And that's, uh, that's something that can only be done through the Holy Ghost. And uh, we, we press through Daniel 2, 7, and 9. We press through the Gospels. Uh, we looked some into the Epistles. Uh, we moved right into the Revelation. And here we are now in Revelation chapter 10. So we've seen a lot of things happen, but one thing that we are assured of is we're still in that first generation that Jesus Christ was a part of. The one that he said would not end until all these things be fulfilled. Now, uh, as I've said many times in the past, um, if, if God shows you something that, because I'm giving you my understanding, of what God has given me over the years. And this started in 1985. So uh, it's the first time I've ever taught this from beginning to end. So I'm learning as you're learning on how to present the facts and the knowledge of the truth that God has given me in such a way it's digestible and a way that it's able to minister life to those that hear it. Because as long as we sit in captivity and darkness believing the theory that has been promoted for the last couple of hundred years, we have to give up the kingdom, we have to give up the king, and we have to give up the, the ruling and reigning of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, and expect that there's going to be an antichrist that's going to rise up in the end, and that this whole book of Revelation that we've been looking at, uh, although we've never seen an antichrist yet, what we have seen is Christ. But at some point, then, Antichrist would have to take over. And Jesus already defeated him. Yeah. Amen. So, because he is a spirit and not a man. Amen. So, once we can get those things legitimately set in our being, they need to be established as a foundation. We have to know that Antichrist is a spirit. And he has manifested for 2,000 years. He's used many men. He's used many women. He's used many countries. He's used a lot of different things 
because he's a liar, he's a deceiver, he's a usurper of authority, he turns people against Christ, he comes alongside the truth and gives you an alternate that has some truth in it, but it leads you away from Christ and not to Christ. Right now, the system that's been formulated takes away the glory of Christ and his incredible seven years and gives it to Antichrist. And then we're looking at the revelation. We've not seen anything but God's mercy and God's grace and his compassion. Even on the generation that had rejected his son and, and, and put him to the cross and everything else, the Father still moving in mercy and grace to restore them and to bring them to repentance. Amen? So we've seen an awful lot of things that God has been doing uh, but we've not seen anything about any antichrist. Amen. Amen. So um, I, I want you to open up to the Holy Ghost of God. If he shows you anything that, that we haven't communicated, share it with me, share it with all of us, whatever. But uh, we're going to press on through. We're going to start in, I believe, Revelation chapter 10. <coughs> Excuse me. Yep. Revelation chapter 10. Uh, chapter 10, we have the angel and the little scroll. All right. You don't even know how the system teaches this thing, but that's okay. The angel and the little scroll very well could be G. Revelation 10, 1. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. Very well could be Jesus in the cloud of God's glory. It, it's not, it doesn't really matter because it's... it's the message that is presented and not the messenger. And a rainbow was upon his head, the throne and covenant of God that speaks of, and his face was it were the sun, the brightness revealed. Uh, and his face was as it were the sun. Now that's the same brightness was revealed about Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, and his feet as pillars of fire also were revealed in Revelation 1 for Jesus. Amen? So it very well could be Jesus. And he added his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. This is the mystery of God that's being revealed, the new covenant, the gospel, 34, 35 A.D. to 64 A.D. If the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ, then of course it can be the thing he was given John for the revelation, but still yet we're in 35 to 64 A.D. We're still in that generation. So we have the messenger of God coming down and he has a book or a scroll, and this scroll is open. It's not closed. It's not sealed. It's already open. So it's being revealed. That means God's saying, don't hide this thing. It's going to be open. Now we have some, some interesting things in this whole thing. In Revelation 10, 6, he swore by him that lives forever and ever that there should be time no longer. Now we heard prophetically back some time ago that God said time was no more. Now, if you're an everlasting being, which if you're a spirit, you should be, time's irrelevant. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, what we're talking about here, um, obviously with, with the message coming down, uh, is putting an end to some things. The time has ended for the old covenant, enter the new covenant, and it signals the end of Daniel 70 weeks. He's talking about that, that there was no time left any longer for that old system, which Hebrews tells us, was finished, was fading away, that God was doing away with the first, that he might establish the second. Amen. Amen. Now, however you want to look at that there is time no longer, the, the thing simply is, in the spirit realm, time isn't irrelevant. But here in the earthly realm, it's very relevant. Yeah. Now, they, I'm sure they project this ahead a couple of thousand years, uh, in, in their understanding of that. But the truth of the matter is is that we're still in that segment, and I'll prove it to you here in just a second, that we're still in that same time frame of that generation that Jesus was talking about, okay? Because this book that is open or scroll is for a very particular reason. It's a, for a particular purpose and for a particular person. And, and that makes things, that makes all the difference in the understanding. Revelation 10, 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, 
when he shall begin to sound. Now notice, I put when in blue because he's speaking forward. This isn't happening at this moment, but he says when he shall begin to sound. So why put that when you're talking about the angel who has this scroll in his hand and he's standing on the land or the earth and on the sea? The, the relevance is, is that when that book that is open is going to pertain to this particular timing. Something is going to happen. So he says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. Now, if you understand scripture, you know what the mystery of God is. The mystery of God was Jew and Gentile together in one body. God using Jesus Christ to reconcile all things in heaven and all things in earth back to himself. That was the mystery of God. It was hidden from before the foundations of the earth. It had never been revealed. Uh, all those things was kept secret. But now, it says when the angel, when that seventh angel begins to blow, then that mystery of God will be fulfilled. It will be engaged. Up to this point, we've been dealing with primarily the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But what happens when that mystery is fulfilled what you're seeing is a timing of what was going on at Cornelius' house. What was going on with Paul. Remember Peter had the vision of the net coming down with the unclean things and God said, rise and eat. And he said, no way, Lord. Nothing unclean's ever touched my mouth. And God says, don't call common or unclean that which I have cleansed. Amen? Amen. Now they considered the Gentiles unclean. So then God tells him, somebody's going to be at your door here in a minute. When they show up, go with them. Well, God's already given Cornelius a dream. Amen. Amen. And in this dream, Peter, he saw Peter, and he's supposed to send for Peter. Peter's supposed to come. At the same time that this is happening, happening Paul, or Saul, is knocked off his, uh, we'll say horse, knocked off his horse, and he's on the ground, and he's blind, and he's being taken to Antioch, and God's beginning to move on him. So all of this is happening at one time. It's a great event because nobody ever saw it coming that God was going to send the gospel to the Gentiles and include the Gentiles together with the Jew in one body. Amen? So that was the mystery. So it's important here, and it mentions it when the book is open. Amen? So when the book is open and... Uh, He's told when the seventh angel begins to blow, the mystery of God will be finished, or actually, it will not be hid anymore. That's what he's talking about. It will be revealed. It will be exposed. <coughs> but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, doesn't mean right now, but when it does start to blow, it will be fully engaged. And this is coming up pretty quickly, but it was kind of a, a foreshadowing, a forewarning. How many knows God doesn't do anything? Unless he what? First reveals it to his servants, the prophets. So God's doing this, and he's already revealing it, making it known. And it just so happens, John is functioning prophetically. Amen? Revelation 10, 7, is he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So he's already told those prophets, but now he has one, kind of like John the Baptist. All the prophets and the law prophesied up until John. John didn't have to prophesy. Why? Because he looked right at Messiah and said, that's him, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Now these prophets prophesied too, but now John is standing there and John already has revelation. He's already met the Lamb of God. He's already seen these things. He knows that. Now the thing that Peter had trouble with and all the other apostles in Jerusalem were the Gentiles. We know they did. Because they had a big debate in Acts chapter 15. Uh, after, after Peter went to Cornelius' house, Peter even made the comment, how could I forbid water to them who had received the Holy Ghost just like we did? Which means they probably told them, whatever you do, don't baptize them. Amen? I, I mean, just kind of looking at it, but they were astonished, the ones who went with Peter, 
when they were astonished at Cornelius' house when God filled the whole house with the Holy Ghost and everybody in there with the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. So that, that shows that there was that division or a lack of understanding. It was still hid. Jesus didn't tell them, I'm going to the Gentiles. What did he tell them? Don't go to anybody but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That He was adamant about that. Even when it was time for him to, to, uh, to, to move on, he was still telling them, only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we looked at a scripture in, in Acts chapter 11 where they were way out into these other areas, but they were only reaching to the Jews who were in those areas, regions and Gentile areas, but they were only going to the Jews. So that was a big thing for them to, because they thought they had a corner market on the kingdom of God. Now, Christianity today, unfortunately, most of them think that the church is Gentile and God's going to do something else with the Jew. That's ridiculous. The, the church for the first seven years was nothing but Jewish. Amen. Amen. Everybody converted on the day of Pentecost was they were all Jews. They were all Israelites. Uh, I, I don't like to use the term Jew because it really speaks more to those who were in Jerusalem than it does all of Israel. So we understand that um, there was a big distinction there and something was going to happen. So this mystery that was going to be fulfilled or accomplished or engaged when that seventh trumpet blows we know when the gospel hit. Now Stephen was, was out there also and he was the first martyr. But it's very significant that God gives a dream to Cornelius, a vision to Peter, and he's converting Paul all at the same time. And then the Holy Ghost fills Cornelius' house showing that the gospel, including Holy Ghost, was now gone to the Gentiles. Didn't depart the Jews, but included the Gentiles. Amen? Amen. So it's, it's important that we understand that time frame because here we are in, in Revelation chapter 10 and we're talking about the conversion of the Gentiles into the church. Are you with me? Yeah. So Christ is still fulfilling the prophets all while all will be before the generation ends. Okay, come on, that's a read your own stuff. So the mystery of God, let's take a look at that. Jew and Gentile in one body. No longer was the gospel taken to the Jews only, but is ready to go to the Gentiles. The 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy was <laughs> fulfilled. Amen. 490 years had ended as decreed. That's where we're at. When that seventh trumpet blows and, and the announcement is made that the gospel is going to the Gentiles, that God has now included them in the plan of salvation, and later we'll see. Uh, in Revelation chapter 14, I believe it is, 13 or 14, where the angel with the gospel, everlasting gospel, go to all the nations is proclaiming it in the heavens. Amen? Amen? So this isn't something we're waiting to happen. This is something that's already recorded, time stamp in history that we know biblically it's, step, it's sound. So the Jew and Gentile, one body, 70 weeks of Daniel's fulfilled. And when you read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, you hear about the, the people of the prince who shall come shall destroy the sanctuary in the city. But that's not within the 70 weeks. That was after the 70 weeks were fulfilled. Because if you're going out there, now the 70 weeks has become 70 years. I, I mean, the last seven years have become 70 years. That's not the way it works. The, 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 the 69th week ended when Jesus was baptized. So the 483 years was over. The last seven years was Jesus Christ in his earthly body and his spiritual body going to none but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. At that point, the gospel had to go to them first. Amen? Yeah. Ephesians 1.9, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now we spoke the other night, and, and I shared with you that heaven itself needed redemption in it. It needed cleanse. That's why 
the pattern of things here in the earthly realm can be cleansed by the blood of bulls and goats and rams and doves and stuff. But the heavenly things themselves needed something more precious than that. It needed the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So what he did here for us, he also did there for them. And then we see out in Revelation chapter 5, we see the 24 elders and the four beasts fall down before the throne and before the Lamb and thank Him and praise Him because He has now redeemed them by His blood. Amen? Amen. <coughs> now, when I was coming up in Christ, I never ever heard that heaven needed cleansed. Did you ever hear that? No. Well, now we know the truth. But I, you think about it. You've got Satan running around in the heavens. He's leaving footprints. Amen. Amen. A lot of things are going on, but here's a good thing. When heaven was cleansed, guess who was kicked out? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Guess what? Heaven was rejoicing. There's, there's things that we have to understand going through the revelation. What's going on in heaven? What's going on in earth? Because there's heavenly things that happen that have an earthly impact. And the things that are in the earth that are happening are, are a direct result of things that are being released by Christ or by the Lord, into the earth. And it will happen in a spirit realm, but it's going to have an earthly manifestation. Kind of like the Father said, let there be light. What showed up? The, the sun, the moon, the star, whatever. I mean, here comes the light, and, and what we see is something that happened there had an earthly impact. Amen? Amen? The Holy Ghost overshadows Mary. Something spiritual had a natural impact. So we have, to, we have to realize that those things are going on because we're looking at God ruling and reigning and carrying out the plan that he had set in from before the foundations of the earth. Everything that he saw that was going to go wrong with Adam and Eve is being fixed right here. Amen. It's a restoration better than what Adam and Eve had. You know why? Because they had corruptible beings. In Christ, when you're born again, you are incorruptible. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So you don't have to eat now of that tree of life to live forever. When you take of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're born again, you become a life-giving, everlasting spirit. Yeah. Amen. 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 All right. Now, don't think you shouldn't eat of the tree of life. I'm not saying that. We should, we should go there and belly up to the table. Amen. But we'll talk about that. The more we get, the more we get spiritually minded and locked into the things of God, the better that we can handle this corruptible world around us. If you can't handle what's going on in the world around you, it's because you're not heavenly minded enough. Amen. Once you tap into the consciousness of God and you know the nature of God and the heart of God and the will of God, then you understand these things around here are corruptible and they are going to present that. But you also realize that you have authority and power over those things and that you can subdue them. But if they're subduing you, it's because your focus isn't where it ought to be. Get out of here. Ephesians 3a, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Amen? Amen. No more. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He talks about the mystery. We've talked about the mystery, the mysterio. The only way to know is to be initiated into it. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, Believed on in the world, received up in the world. Amen? Amen. That's, that was the mystery of God, and it was hid 
Well, here in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1, we have this angel or Jesus. It's a messenger. The, the word is angelos. And it, it, it means messenger. So it looks like Jesus by the description, but it doesn't have to be. The message is the key. The book is open, and what is he talking about? He's talking about the inclusion of the Gentiles. He's talking about the basically the uh, the mystery of God being fulfilled. Revelation 10:10. 10, 10. He was told to, to go get the book, and he says, "I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter." Now, Ezekiel did that same thing uh, when he ate it, and, and what it was, that message he got was to go to the house of Israel. That was the big deal, is that Ezekiel was going to go have to tell Israel, you're in bad shape. Uh, God's getting ready to put a whooping on you, and you ain't going to like it at all. And he said unto me, Revelation 10, 11, thou must prophesy again. Who is he talking to? The angel's talking to John. Amen? Now, John is told something when he ate that book. He said, thou must prophesy again. I don't think John's still alive today, do you? Not here. I'm sure he's alive in the heavenlies. But this prophesying again, Revelation 10, 1, a direct message to John, what you just consumed, which was really the everlasting gospel and the mystery of God, was going to be revealed and he said, you must prophesy again before many people, nations, tongues, and kings. So that gives you a time stamp. We know John made it through the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the temple and everything else. He, he lived up into the 90s, uh, AD, uh, 90s AD, but he's not still here. He did do some prophesying. He did do things and, and communicate. But the truth of the matter that, that has to be locked in is this is, this is within the time frame of the first century and not the 21st century. Amen? Amen. Because you've got to remember that the common teaching is the church was taken out in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Yeah. We didn't see it, but they say it's supposed to happen when, when there was a door open in heaven and the voice said, come up here. They say that's the rapture, but we know what that voice said. Come up here. I want to show you things that get ready to happen. That's what it's talking about. And that's all it was talking about. So this event has to be prior to the end of John's life. And what he is experiencing in this vision pertains to him. This event couldn't occur after his death over 2,000 years later. Amen? So the time stamp 35 to 96 AD, more than likely around 64 AD. So Revelation chapter 11. The Old Covenant temple and system is being measured for its burial, its ending, its fulfillment. Revelation chapter 11. These are the foretold events that Jesus had revealed that would come upon that generation, even as the Gospels and the Revelation all agree. This is still the time of the wrath of the Lamb that was foretold by Jesus that would come upon the Lamb's city and temple. We saw that in the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6. And what was happening was they were calling for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That was the whole thing. It's not changed. We're still in that same uh, frame set. We're still in that same uh, actions that are taking place. Uh, we know that... Uh, we know that the, the vengeance of the Lamb was going to be in that first generation. Even Jesus said those things were going to happen. That there were those things that would, that would not pass until all those things be fulfilled. <coughs> Revelation chapter 11. This agreed with Daniel 2, 7, and 9 that this would happen to Daniel's people, the city, Jerusalem, and the Holy Temple. Revelation 11, 1. There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So there were three particular things that he was supposed to measure. Now, I think God knew the size of the temple, don't you? And, and he knew the size of the altar. I know the size of the altar. It was one cubit square on the top and it was two cubits high. 36 inches high, 18 inches square on top. 
had a crown that set on it. When he's talking about this altar, he's talking about the altar of incense that sat right outside the, the tabernacle or the, the curtain that went into the Holy of Holies. It sat right there. And, and the only fire that could go on it, like we shared the other night, had to come from the sacrificial altar out in the courtyard. They had to use that fire. If they used any other fire, it was a strange fire. And we know that Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, died because they used strange fire. Amen? I think there's a lot of strange fire going on in Christianity today. And, and that's on God. I mean, that's his deal. But there's a lot of strange fire for people think act like they're all fired up for God when it's just a, a fleshly carnal thing. That's strange fire. So the angel stood saying, Rise, measure the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship therein. Now, you can't measure the temple unless the temple's there. Yeah. Amen. Right? Now we know that there are um, there's Huron and Naos. talks about two temples. So we're looking at, in this particular case, he's not talking necessarily about a physical temple but the spiritual temple. Because God already knew the size of the natural physical temple. But what was happening was is that the Gentiles were being included. Now he makes a specific statement here where he says in Revelation, but the court which is without the temple or outside of the temple leave out and measure it not for it's given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot Forty and two months. That brings a direct relationship back to the natural physical temple that was going on in Jerusalem. And what he was saying was, is that that inner court, the tabernacle or the temple itself, don't don't mess with that, or, or that is measurable, but that that is outside is going to be destroyed. So it's important whether you look at it in a spiritual sense, because we know natural Israel was never the people of God. Even Paul said that. He said the natural seed, the natural descendants are not counted for the seed. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that because it, we, we've shared that before. If the natural seed counted, then Ishmael would have to count and Esau would have to count. But they didn't. Why? Because it was the children of the promise. That's what God was addressing. So the children of the promise were those who had the circumcision in the heart by the Spirit and not a circumcision in the flesh. <coughs> Amen? Amen? So it's important that we remember that. Now Christianity, they have to know that, but I don't think it means anything to them. I, I think they're still looking. They don't realize that the church began on the foundation of, of the apostles and prophets, but they were Jews. Amen? Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody could argue with that. Even when you see the temple... In Revelation chapter 21, 22, the foundation are the 12 apostles. And, and, and the walls and the gates in the walls were the 12 tribes of Israel. Now what's Gentile about that? There's absolutely nothing in it. So when, when the courtyard is, is left out, we know that the Gentiles are trading that underfoot. So we're pre-70 A.D., we're, we're still around, uh, at the very latest, would have to be uh, 66, 67. So it's another time stamp. The outer court would be given to the Gentiles. Future would be 66 to 70. So it's pre-66. City would be trampled underfoot three and a half years. Also future would be 66 to 70 AD. So all those things hadn't happened yet. If they had happened yet, that would be ridiculous to make that statement. How many knows they're not going to trample down the holy Jerusalem? Not the heavenly Jerusalem. There's, there's, that's not the issue. So we're looking at a, a physical time stamp of what he's saying. This was the second woe to those that had not repented at the gospel message and still had not the Father's name placed upon them. We saw in Revelation chapter 9 that all these things were happening. The first four trumpets dealt with the land, the sea, the trees, the fresh waters, and, and the things of that nature. Nobody got harmed in the first four trumpets. In the fifth trumpet, what we seen in the fifth trumpet was that there were scorpions or a sting that was going to come. Still wasn't going to kill them, but it was going to it was going to mess with them for five months. And and what is said at the end of that is still they repented not of the works of their hands. So God was allowing and bringing that. 
to, to let them say, hey, all your provisions going away, no water, no food, no trees, no grass, no nothing, but they still wouldn't repent. They cursed God over it. And so then here comes this that actually starts physically affecting their being in, in the fifth trumpet, and, and still they wouldn't. And then in the sixth trumpet, they actually one-third was permitted to be taken out, and, but the rest of them still would not repent. So we see God in his mercy and grace in Revelation 9 trying to bring them to repentance. And then in Revelation chapter 10, we see where the angels coming down and John saying, look, this message is going to get more fuller. You, you've got more to do. You're not done yet. And then in Revelation chapter 11, what we see here, he's telling John, he said, you can look at the temple, but it's not going to be the way you, you see it. The old, the the whole outer court's going to be wasted. As a matter of fact, we know as a result, the whole temple, Jesus had told them, not one stone would be left upon another. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But we're still in that time segment. And it's important. And, and I'm going beyond the time stamps. If we just stuck with the time stamps, we'd have been done a week ago. But we need more of a foundation because what is out there is such a great deception and such a great lie of the enemy that even... You can say the very elect have been deceived by it. Amen? Amen. So this is the Father through Jesus Christ, still disciplining and chastening those he loves. This is not an antichrist. This is God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. They want to attribute all of this to an antichrist that doesn't exist except for in a spirit form. 11.3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, which is three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. Revelation 11, for these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So who are the two candles? Who are the two witnesses? Two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now when you go back and look in Zechariah, you can go back in some of the other prophets, and there is a mention of seeing these things and when they do there are these olive trees and there are basically uh, tubes coming out of the olive trees feeding into the lamp stand or the candlestick and they're providing the oil for the light in the heavens Amen. now this was going on a long time ago now I know they want to make these two people they want to make these either Moses and, and Enoch, or they want to make it Moses and Elijah, or Elijah and Enoch, whatever they want to do, I, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, it's not relevant. It's not relevant, because they're, they give their testimony, they give their witness, the enemy, the, the one who come out of the bottomless pit, these two men evidently are so powerful, the enemy has to make war against them. Let's look a little further. Many attempt to make it Moses, Elijah, Elijah, I've said that. Mainly because the power is given them. Elijah shut heaven, no rain, three and a half years. That's one of the indications given it. Moses turned water to blood to release plagues on Egypt. Now it said in this particular scripture, I think, hopefully I put it up there. In any case, it, whether it's up there or not, it, it says that these two were given power to shut heaven so that no rain would come in the days of their ministry, and also they were given the ability to release plagues and to also turn the water into blood. So they want to think Moses, and they want, I, you could easily convert that to being the law and the prophets. Are you with me? Yeah. So, here's the thing. God doesn't say who it is other than it's two candlesticks and two olive trees. Amen? Now, I challenge you to search the scripture for any man that's called an olive tree. The only one, Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Amen? He didn't say olive vine. He just said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. But there is a discussion about olive trees, and we're going to look at that briefly. So, Elijah, we know, was John the Baptist. He was beheaded before Jesus' crucifixion. Moses was took on the mountaintop and Satan and Michael disputed over the body of Moses as mentioned in Jude. So these two lived and died. They passed. Amen. 
even Elijah who came back, Jesus said, if you can believe it, if you can receive it, John is the Elijah who was to come. Amen? Amen. Obviously, they can't receive it or they wouldn't be saved <coughs> to Elijah. So in any case, let's, let's see what it says. Jude 1, 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, Jurist not bring against him a railing accusation that said the Lord rebuked thee. So two witnesses are unidentified by Scripture. Symbolically, they are the two covenants that coexist for three and a half years and are seen in Zechariah as two trees emptying out their oil into the candlestick or the wine. What we do know about the two witnesses is that they were two olive trees and two lampstands. Anything beyond that is speculation. Amen? There, there is no way to tie in and identify. It's one of those things. If we needed to know who it was, God would have told us. Amen. But, but the relevance of that is not there, or God would have. Two lamps and before the Lord. These were known to be the two covenants that was existing in the heavens that prophesied 1260 days, power to shut heaven, no rain, power to turn water to blood, power to release plagues. Beasts made war against them, killed them. They rose again after three and a half days and went to God on the fire. Amen? Amen? Anybody know who it is? I thought you always said it was the spirit of word. What was it? The spirit of word, that's what I understood at the same time. But that's what I'm saying. It, it, I, I believe it, it was the ministry of the spirit and the word. Now, could, he have, could they have used physical bodies to have carried out that ministry in the earth? Well, absolutely. But do we know who that is? No, we don't know. Could the Spirit and the Word have laid dead in the streets of Jerusalem for three days? Three and days? No. And then the Spirit of life enter back into them? No. Did they have to be given power to do these things? No, they already possessed that. Yeah. So, what, whatever the case is, there were two witnesses evidently, but God didn't want to tell us who they were, so it's, it's not relevant. But Jesus mentioned Elijah uh, as being in John as a witness. He said that his disciples would be witnesses. The Father bore witness of him. He said the works that he did bore witness of him. He said the Spirit and the Word bore witness of him. Amen? Amen. He even told his disciples, you will be witnesses unto me. And, and all this whole region, this whole land. Amen? So the relevance simply is that it had to be prior to 66 to 70 AD. The city was destroyed, and their dead bodies could not fly in the street of the great city. Now, a lot of people say, well, that was Babylon. No, it wasn't Babylon. Was spiritual is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Anybody know where Jesus was crucified? Had to be Jerusalem. Amen? So spiritually, Jerusalem was called Sodom and Egypt. Now that's where the Lord was crucified, so where did the two dead bodies lay at? Had to be in Jerusalem. Amen? So in any case, spiritually, Sodom, Egypt, and Babylon, as you'll find out later, no city or partying after 70 AD. So it had to happen prior to that. As a reminder, still no Antichrist, no seven-year tribulation, no rapture, still no covenant being made with an Antichrist. It's all being done by God. There is no other reference in all scriptures where a people is likened unto an olive tree. Paul does it in Romans 11, and then the two witnesses are identified. Here is the two olive trees standing before God. doesn't matter, so you decide. Romans 11, 13, I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Amen? Amen. That's not hard to understand. <coughs> And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, amen? Now we're getting into the olive tree, fine. But he's also talking to the Gentiles. 
He's saying, okay, Gentiles, you're a wild olive tree. Well, what would that make the Israelites at that time? They would have been the pure olive tree, right? They were the one to whom were given the promises and everything else. Being a wild olive tree were wrapped in among them and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So what he's saying is that he, he took the Gentiles and grabbed them in to the tree and that they now are partakers of the root and everything else. Yeah. In other words, they have Abraham for a body. Amen. Romans 11 and 18, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root, thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed that he also not spare thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God's able to graft them in again. Amen? Amen. So he's talking about the olive tree. Look, for if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Amen? Okay. What were the Israelites, the, even the, the chief priests, the high priests, and all of them in Jerusalem, were they part of the good olive tree? They couldn't have been. Because Jesus said, you're of your father, the, the devil. He said, my father is God. Oh, he said, he said, I'm coming to you of my father, whom you say is God, or whom you claim is your God. But he said, he's not your God. Are you with me? Yeah. I, I'm not asking tricky questions. I'm just trying to see. He's not talking about individual people here. He's talking about the covenant agreements. You've got the Old Covenant, you, which is promise, and then you have these who are brought in, being brought into that because they are partaker of the root. Who is the root? Who was the promises made to? Abraham and his seed. Amen? So he's saying that you were not a people, but now you have become the people of God, not as Gentiles, but as God's children. That we have, you have been, you've not been... In other words, he didn't come over here to do it there. He brought you over here and put you right into the tree. Amen. Amen. So the promise was the key. Because what was the promise? The promise was actually, remember Jesus said, Tear you in Jerusalem to be endued with power on high, for you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to you. And to as many that are far off, as many as the Lord God shall call. Amen? Amen. The Holy Ghost was the promise. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. So when he's talking about grafting them in, he's talking about bringing them in, putting them in line. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you were baptized into Christ, it's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you, right? Amen. So that you, who were wild by nature, now have your nature changed. You're not partaking anymore of this Adamic nature, but now you are grafted into the last Adam, receiving the godly nature. Amen. And you are an inheritor of the promises because everyone who has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and you have now become Abraham's seed. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. So that's what he's doing, and that's what he's talking about here. But the only application that's mentioned anywhere in Scripture about olive trees, wild and good, the two that would be basically bringing uh, forth the oil that would go into the lampstand were these two covenants. Now, they can say it's Abraham or Moses or Elijah. It doesn't matter. What, what simply does matter is that these two bore witness. Amen? Amen? These two bore witness. God gave them power to do it. But we know it had to happen in that generation.
because all those things had to be fulfilled before that generation passed. The seventh trumpet, Revelation 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded. What was going to happen when the seventh angel sounded? <coughs> the mystery of God would be completed. And what was the mystery of God? Jew and Gentile being brought together in one body. In Christ, things in heaven and things in earth reconciled back to God. So we know when that happened. We know at Cornelius' house, God sent a dream, a message, and called another guy, knocking him off his donkey, and, and, and was bringing that all together around 35 A.D. Are you with me? Amen. So we know this seventh trumpet... When, when the mystery of God is engaged or, or fulfilled or complete, that means he's not hiding it anymore. He's making it known. The book was open yeah. in Revelation 10. Amen? So when the seventh angel sounded, there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Now, God mentions in Revelation 10 that when that horn blows, the mystery of God will be it'll be fulfilled. Then it blows and he don't say anything about it. Are you with me? Yeah, so you have to have understanding to know what it is that God's talking about. So the seventh trumpet blows. Now what was going to happen at the seventh trumpet? I know Jesus said, yeah, at the sound of the last trump, the dead in Christ shall rise. That's the trump right there. Yeah. There's no more. If you read in Daniel chapter 7, you'll find out that when the ancient of days sits, then the books were opened. What people are expecting at the end of the age to be judgment, and there's going to be this big great throne and and billions of people stacked on top of each other, it's a fantasy. That's already happened. If you leave here without Christ, you have no hope. Amen. Are you with me? We're living in a new day, a new time. We're not in the day of, of the ancients that was there. What happened was, is that all of these things began to happen. There is no holding place there anymore. All who are in Christ live. All who are in Adam die. Yeah. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. The seventh trump, the angel sounded, the, the, there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Daniel chapter 2, he, he said the days of these kings he will set up his kingdom. It, it won't uh, ever be given to anybody else. It's going to last forever. It's going to have dominion over all the earth. In Daniel chapter 7, he said the exact same thing. But he went into more detail and said that the saints of God would be given the kingdom and they would possess the kingdom. Are you with me? Amen. This isn't something we're waiting to happen. This has happened a long time ago. It's just been hid because the spirit of Antichrist has deceived the church into giving up the kingdom and, and to giving up um, dominion, giving up authority, giving up power, and all the other things. That's why they're just trying to hold on until Jesus returns, and then he'll set up the kingdom. That's nowhere in the book. I've read that whole book many times. It's not in there in the book saying he's going to come back and then he'll set it up. It doesn't happen. Matter of fact, it doesn't say anything in there that, that he ever withdrew the kingdom. That he ever took the kingdom away. God said he was going to do it. He showed the stone hitting the image in Daniel 2 on, on the feet, ankles, and taking it out and everything crumbling. And then, boom. And, and then the God of heaven will set his kingdom up. Now that was in the days of those kings. So, I mean, there's a lot that the spirit of Antichrist has done. He's even taken the focus off of him being a spirit and has caused Christianity to believe it's going to be a man. Yeah. Amen. Now, I don't know where you're at in the whole thing, but I can tell you that most of Christianity believes that. Yeah, they, do. they do believe that. 
So if you're looking for a man, you're not watching for the spirit of Antichrist to do his deal. You're standing back here looking for this guy whose numbers of his name is going to line up to 666. And we got all these, they've got all these theories and everything that's out there. But we're not looking for a man who's 666. We identified the beast, which was the, the name or had a man's number. And we understood, and we looked at that already back in Daniel. We even looked at that. So here we're seeing the seventh trumpet, and the seventh trumpet was when the mystery of God was complete. So if you don't, if you don't hear the revelation given in Revelation 10, that when the trumpet blows, the mystery of God will be complete and be fulfilled. If you don't take that and put it in here, he doesn't tell it tell you again. But here's how he reveals it. It's no longer just king of Israel and washing for the house of Israel sitting on the throne of David. Now he has all the nations. Are you with me? The Gentiles are now included. He's king. See, when Jesus defeated Satan, he didn't just win Israel. Satan didn't just have authority and power to deceive Israel. He was fighting Israel because he knew Israel was going to bring forth the man-child who was going to finish him off. Amen. Satan, as the serpent, deceived Eve in the garden and got Adam to willingly bow to his way of thinking. And, and Adam gave all of mankind, all of the kingdoms of the world, all the authority and the power on the whole earth to Satan. Yeah. Amen. Now when Jesus defeated him as a man, there was a rip that took place in the universe. You, you had all these who were still subordinate to Satan, but now there's a new king in town. Amen. Amen. And, and this came... This was the first Adam. This is the last Adam. And, and what was happening was there, there were citizens being born into this new Adam, this last Adam. And, and Jesus had authority and power over all of it now. And we see it here in very possibly 35, maybe 36 A.D. When that seventh trumpet blew, what we understand that was happening then was that the mystery of God, the Jew and Gentile together in one body, Jesus was reconciling not just Jew and Gentile into one body, he was reconciling heaven and earth. Amen. And bringing them together. Are you with me? <coughs> so, it's simply stated in, in Revelation 10, it tells us that the mystery of God will be completed or fulfilled. But here it says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of his Lord and his Christ and he'll reign forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Jesus started reigning over everything when he defeated Satan. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Now we see in Daniel chapter 7 and also in the Revelation where Jesus shows up to the Ancient of Days. And we know what he receives because Daniel says it and even the uh, four beasts and the 24 elders say it that he was given dominion and power and glory and honor and he was ruling and reigning and, and in Daniel 7 he says literally he received his kingdom. He was carried to the ancient of days on a cloud and received his throne. Are you with me? This is in 35 or 36 A.D. This is not 2,000 years from then. We're not waiting 10, 12, 15 more years to get that. This has happened. And this is what the enemy has stole from the church. The knowledge of the truth that you rule and reign right now. Christ gave the kingdom to us. Amen? Amen. So here, it, I, I mean, if we don't believe the kingdom's even here and it's not even going to be here until Jesus shows up one day, we're not seeking the kingdom. That would be ridiculous. How are you going to seek something you can't find? And like we said years ago, why would he tell you to seek something that ain't even there yet? Yeah, amen. 
But he's trying to. He's saying, look, you need to see things the way they really are because the Antichrist, that spirit that has infiltrated the teachings of Christianity and has got into the hearts and the minds of believers, they're saying the kingdom's not there. That means Jesus isn't king. That means Satan has not yet been defeated. And all this stuff still has to happen. That's why they jerked the church out in Revelation 4. Is because if they keep it in there, all of a sudden, you're triumphant and victorious. All of a sudden, you are in possession of the kingdom that Jesus took and give the authority and the power to you to dominate over the enemy so that nothing by any means would be able to harm you and he gave you power over all the power of the enemy. Amen? So in Revelation 10, the seventh trump was going to be the completion of the mystery of God, it would be fulfilled. Now, in Revelation 11, 15, the seventh trump blows. And we see that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ and He reigns forever and ever. The seventh trumpet, as it sounds, the mystery of God is complete or fulfilled. What this means is that the inclusion of the Gentiles or the mystery of God was complete. Revelation 10, 7 says, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. Amen? Amen. Now we look at that, but I'm going to tell you, the body of Christ don't believe this. They don't believe what I'm telling you right now. And, and, and it goes just like anything else in Christ. You have to be fully persuaded in your own mind. I'm going to tell you, the enemy will fight you. But, but we look at the references of the mystery of God. Paul told us all about it. Timothy mentioned it. In Revelation 11, 15, we see now that the days of the voice of the seventh angel is fulfilled. The mystery of God is fully engaged. 35 AD. Amen? I'm not going to brag on the devil that that rascal's done one hell of a job in, in being able to steal away. He, he's convinced us that we're just old sinners saved by grace. And the body of Christ has nursed off that and made excuses. Well, the devil made me do it. No, he, he's not. He, I'm not going to glorify or honor him or even revere him in any way. Amen? Because God has made you kings and priests of the Most High God. You rule and reign in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ have dominion over the earth and over the kingdom of darkness and everything else. The gates of hell cannot prevail against you. Even if you use a water pistol. The mystery of God, Jew and Gentile, one body, no longer was the gospel taken to you only, but it now, that's what I shared earlier. The 70th week of Daniel was finally fulfilled. That was, he had to seal up vision and prophecy. That prophetic utterance by Daniel, given to him by God, had to be fulfilled and complete. And it was not to go to any. God guaranteed them seven years of confirming the covenant. And it had ended. Now what you'll see after this later on, when we get into some of the others, is that those things are being ripped and taken out and God's done with them. Amen? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know where we're at, but we've got to be close to the end. Uh, we've already done to that. Anyway, um, we're probably 10 minutes over. But anyway, Father, we bless you. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. Lord, we, we yield to you, Lord. Help us to see what you're trying to reveal and help us to to overthrow thoughts and imaginations and things that may have been seeded in our lives by the system, Lord, that may have us to believe something that isn't true. And Lord, anything coming out of me, Father, that's not true, let it just disappear and vanish away. And Father, I pray that those who have ears to hear will hear what the Spirit is saying and that they will be rooted and grounded and established in the truth that is present with them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.